Okay, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being here for this quarter's luminary lecture. My name is Carla Alcindor. I'm the director of the UST Max Center, which is the University of St. Thomas's micro campus located in downtown Conroe. And it's my pleasure to introduce to you tonight's special guest speakers. Elena and Steve Monroe share their experiences and the tools that they use to cultivate enduring connection and build a resilient marriage and family. Elena and Steve moved to Conroe, Texas in 2021 after working as actors for more than 30 years in Hollywood. They are still active entertainment professionals and Steve has worked as a licensed marriage and family therapist in private practice since 2016. He currently has an office in the Woodlands. They are parents to two girls and parishioners at Sacred Heart Parish here in Conroe, Texas. They are here tonight to share thoughts on how to turn romantic love into real love and that love is not blind, it is visionary. So please join me in welcoming Elena and Steve <laughs> Monroe. All right, so it's 2001 and I am a recent graduate of the Franciscan University in Steubenville with a theater degree and I am discerning religious life. And I'm discerning what strain of weed will get me the most high. <laughs> and here we are today in 2023 in Conroe with all of you lovely people. And um, we're so honored to be able to be here to chat with you guys intimately about our experience with our relationship and kind of going from Hollywood's vision of romantic love or infatuation to real concrete love. As most of you guys know, in your relationships, it's hard, it takes a lot of work. I think I know I could learn from you. Mm -hmm. So I'm really humbled and honored and grateful to Brenda and Carla for this opportunity. Our date night, our girls are out in the rain somewhere. <laughs> I think they're okay, but uh, um, so yes, absolutely. So um, we're, what we're going to do, we're going to give you kind of a history of how we met, uh, some um, how uh, our history as actors a little bit, a little bit of about my work as a therapist in private practice, and then some tools that you likely already have, but maybe we can offer some tweaks. Uh, and in communication and connection. So um, 2004, I will take you back, and I am <clears throat> sitting on my couch in the Hollywood Hills, and I'm uh, stoned out of my mind, and um, I am in a moment of lucidity. I'm sitting there in this haze. My fiance at the time is out. She's out doing something, and um, <clears throat> I have what I came to learn as, is a God shot. I um, had this moment of clarity in in this in this mess, and uh, and, and and this voice. It said very clearly, "I can't be this guy if I am going to be a husband and eventually a father. I can't be this guy." And in that moment, I knew uh, the affair with marijuana was over and I had to change. And, but not before really one last kiss of the bottle of vodka on the top of the fridge. So, uh, <laughs> Meanwhile, I am back in Ohio where I grew up and was raised and had just finished becoming a theater major at Franciscan University because there's lots you can do with that. And my aspiration was to perhaps become a religious. But I also had this part of me that was like, hmm, I think I want to meet the perfect Catholic man who's super devout guy, right, right. and wants to have a farm somewhere in the woods with our 10 little children and we will just pray the rosary every night as we walk around and feed the chickens and that kind of thing. So I was torn. I'm like 50-50. Do I want to be a religious? Is God calling me to that or is he calling me? to married life. Um, I did not meet, I didn't get my MRS degree at Franciscan University like I thought I would. I did not meet this man, this imaginary man. Um, and my mom, when I was seriously contemplating religious life, kind of shook me to reality and said, Elena, you cannot have a mound of debt and become a religious. You have to have all that gone. And Franciscan University was not inexpensive. And so I had a mound of debt. So I thought, okay, what can I do? What can I do? 
I know, I'll move to LA and become an actor. That will help me pay up all my debt, and then God can, you know, do, he can help me that way and I can go do what I want to do. So what I'm hearing you say, in order to become a nun, one first must become an actor mm -hmm. and then become a nun. And then get rid of debt, because that's going to be super easy. Go to LA, become an actor. I mean, that you make yeah. money as an actor. It's it's win-win. It's easy. It's easy. Hmm. So I'm in LA, I'm a vegan, and I'm like living my life, doing my thing, and I walk into this Christmas party that my Catholic friend was hosting along with her Protestant, Protestant friend. roommate. Who that a friend, friend of mine. So we walk into this party together and I go right. one way, he goes the other. And I'm standing at the, uh, at the, you know, the refreshments table as I have a tendency to do. <laughs> and uh, I say, as any single sophisticated, suave man would say under those circumstances, I said, are you going to eat that? As I pointed <laughs> to a plate, you know, some ribs and licked my fingers, I said, <laughs> That was, and that, that was well, apparently... Well, cut to 2011, he converted to Catholicism and I converted back to eating meat. So we have this little interesting relationship of um, uh, maybe he wasn't that cookie cutter thing that I thought I had in my head of what God intended, um, my Catholic husband in the woods frolicking with our 10 little children, but he's everything and more. Um, and what Steve brings to the table as a marriage and family therapist um, is so vital to us, turning what was a romantic infatuation of being in love mm -hmm. with someone like we all at some point hopefully work with our spouse mm -hmm. into real solid love. And that comes from the communication tools that he's taught me that I wasn't necessarily taught as a kid. So in 2004, I resolved to get sober and um, I have a lot to credit is uh, my, my therapist at the time, this just lovely, just faith-filled woman of, of immense love, uh, this older Jewish woman, she must have been 80-something, who has she since graduated. Um, and she, she loved me back to health in ways that I, are truly just stay with me and um, inspire me. So. Um, she inspired my, me to get sober, really, and, and I followed in her footsteps and became a therapist because um, I had had success as an actor in the 90s, um, mid-90s, and then opportunities started to dry up uh, with the uh, saturation of reality TV. It cut my opportunities in half. So I had to, to really kind of diver diversify my skill set. So uh, that was... Uh, uh, concurrent with my sober walk and then uh, my therapy with Betty. So I went to school and, and got um, my um, master's degree. So 2009, the year before I completed my master's is when uh, we walked into the party that fateful night. He was and no longer engaged <laughs> to the previous Well, year. well that, that, yeah, that, that, thank goodness. And I, I have a debt of gratitude to my first fiance. Hello, welcome. Hi, welcome. You made it. Yes. Please. We're very Grab, casual yeah. and just, yes, having a, a chit chat. So, um, uh, your first fiance. So who, I have a debt of gratitude to her, you know. She didn't like sober Steve. And that, you know, that's okay. That's okay. It's okay. You know, I, <laughs> it led me to, to her. her well. So, um, uh, so Betty, back to Betty. Betty taught me primary relationship first with God, then self, and then others. If I'm not right here, I can't, or here, I can't be right with anybody else. And so that, that really, and she championed my walk as a Christian. I was a casual Christian um, until I met Elena when it became clear to me, well, the next indicated step in my faith walk after, you know, Christ really removed from me my obsession to drink and to use, um, the next indicated step was quite logically to become Catholic. And I, I am the richer for it. And I... Um, so, so, with Betty's inspiration and the idea of primary relationship, God and then self and then others, you know, um, that deepening of my faith and, and learning through Elena and, and, and the Catholic faith about the authenticity of Christ and Christ's love and, and the, t the, the tears, the, the tears of blood he cried on the cross. Uh, um, really deepened um, my faith and, and my understanding of what, what love is and the idea really that 
um, I, I've come to learn in therapy terms as secure attachment, where really the overarching quality of secure attachment is safety, and not, not just physical safety, but the experience of emotional safety, because just by virtue of proximity, we're gonna step on each other's toes. Stress, life stressors, the storms, right? Mm -hmm. they're, they're gonna bring us face to face with our own shortcomings, and so we better be sure our shortcomings are still pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, the, the idea then, um, if we can get past the, the feeling, the, the romance, the butterflies, because when the storms come, you know, we're going to retreat to those old coping mechanisms unless we have tools. And so that's really what informs our, our talk tonight and, and what I hope to share with you. So um, among them, and, and I want to draw your attention to this really powerful book called How We Love. It's by Mylan and Kay Yurkovich. Mylan is a uh, pastor, and his wife, Kay, is a, a licensed marriage and family therapist like myself. And um, really, the, the bulk of this book is rooted in sound psychology, attachment theory. And um, there are, uh, they, they put terminology of attachment in, in a bit different terms than, than the more kind of um, orthodox or classical theory. Um, but they are, they, they are consistent, though termed differently. So for example, there are uh, really, uh, three, four, or four or five different um, styles, and, and the overarching sentiment really is that determines a person's attachment style is, is a question. How were you comforted? So, invariably, <clears throat> when I have clients and they come and sit across from me in my office, invariably, they have, uh, they have something going on, okay? We carry in us two tanks and they sit across from me, their fuel tank is empty and their pressure tank is full, right? So how do we re-regulate that? Well, we, we look at the attachment style uh, of their parents or their primary caregivers when, uh, as they grew up. I asked them, can you think of a time when you were hurt, when you, when you were in pain, right? And then something comes up um, or it doesn't, which is also information. You know, there's a, a, a barrier between head and heart common, right? Easier to just compartmentalize it. But just with some, some creating the space for whatever the feelings are, wherever they go, generally something comes up. And, and then the follow-up question is, how were you comforted? And a lot of times people don't, don't remember. It's, I, I, and that's information, right? So, for example, um, I learned to retreat I was, um, and please understand, when, when I talk about my parents, this is not in, in any way about blame or finger pointing. I am richly blessed, and, and I think you would agree, yes. echo that about your mom and dad. Mm -hmm. It's not about casting blame or pointing fingers. It's really about connecting dots. And they often learned from how they were loved and how they were taught. So. It's a generational pattern, and, and I, 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 do what my par I, I do what my parents did. Right? So um, I went away to boarding school when I was 13 and, and a number of circumstances um, and, and hurts and pains kind of inspired retreat. I had to learn to kind of comfort myself in solitude. And so um, that's how I refuel. I just, I go away. And that played out later in, when I formed those counterfeit connections with alcohol and marijuana. Those were my, my uh, inauthentic, my non-relational counterfeit connections and um, something about that kind of... Well, whereas I was taught to pursue, so I also, we both come from very solid families, mm -hmm. um, but children of the 40s and 50s or what have you, and just a different way of raising your children or whatever, um, my mom pursued my husband. Yes, they had a very romantic, lovely relationship, but what I witnessed as a child was my father, who worked his tail off at a coal mine, you know, kind of a situation in Ohio, would come home from work exhausted, and he would as well retreat. He would go bowling with the guys or go play his fiddle. He was at a polka band. And so I witnessed my father running away to go refuel, to fill up his tank. So 
similar to what Steve does. And my mom would pursue him and my mom would chase after him. So I was like, oh, got it. The girl has to go after the guy. That's what I was taught. So often I look in my past in pursuing men and that sort of a thing versus being pursued and how we've had to make adjustments in our relationship to kind of halt that, to mm -hmm. teach our children, mm, wait a minute, there's a better way. Well, and Elena is so good, I think, at first, that was quite disarming, right? Well, to paint a little picture back to 2011 when we first got married, again, I was on the path of religious life, perhaps. He was on the path to Hollywood and doing everything that that involved in regards to drinking and smoking and all that. So he put a halt on that. But false 2011, gods, false, false gods. gods. But I was very centered and focused on that God. Um, so here I am, Virgin Bride 2011, 32 years old. So that's kind of, it's an achievement, but it's also, that's a long time to be in that path and mentality. And I get married and we have our wedding that is glorious. It's so much fun. There were 450 people there because I'm from a small town in Ohio and the whole place was filled with my family. Right, <laughs> and um, right. so we got married and we had our one beautiful night together. And then the next day he gets whisked away to go shoot a pilot, a, a episode of a TV show in Washington. So like literally the next day I'm like, all right, no more husband for how long? So I think two, two weeks. weeks, two weeks later he comes home and I'm like, okay, what does Hollywood tell me? Oh, okay, I have to put something cute on. He's going to come in the door. It's going to be great. And I, you know, he comes home, walks in the door and I'm like, hi. And he's like, hey, task, 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 task. And I'm like, what is going on? Like, I know we didn't live together before we were married. And we really had like about a 10 month courtship and then a six month engagement and then we were married. So we were still learning each other. And he was 38, I was 32. Like, I can't we were, talk, I can't, I, I've got stuff to do. We I gotta set in our ways and I didn't know this stuff about him. So well, now I know, so here I am feeling hurt in the moment as a young bride whose yeah. husband has just dissed her because he came in the door and had to do all these things. Uh, later then, after conversations, we realize, oh, Steve has to check mark all these boxes. And so now I know I might not even get a kiss when he walks in the door, and it's okay because later on we can have our time together. But we've had to discuss that. If I would have stayed in that moment of like, I'm being rejected, he's not who I thought he was, I'm done. There goes, you know, our 30 minute relationship that seems to be like what the uh, colleagues of ours in the industry were to have been doing. But I, and I, it makes me sad to consider that. I, I and, and part of my struggle with anxiety has been OCD. I, I, I have a task list, and, and honestly, and it may, it, but we've learned to navigate it, and that's where I was going. Is you are yeah. so, you have you have been so um, accepting, and that's a, another key word when it comes to secure attachment. The beautiful irony of acceptance is that when someone has the experience of acceptance, and this is what I've come to learn is what, what Christ's offer, uh, Christ offers, acceptance. The, the beautiful irony of that is then it accelerates that person's growth into their better and best selves versus shaming. And so um, Elena's learned, been so patient with me in making the space for, because uh, if I can speak for mm, you. Of course. Elena, a, a, a part of her refueling her tank and letting, uh, releasing the pressure valve on your tank is in connection. I am an extrovert. I need to talk. And someone who is claimed to be more introverted I and feel needs threatened. to run away, I'm I get, like, I feel, whoa! <laughs> Even the word, how are you doing? Whoa! It can I, be I, triggering, and, but I know that now. I know that that's not me. That's, he just got done listening to four couples talk about all this stuff, whatever, you know, at the therapy sessions, and then he has an audition to shoot, and then he's walking in the door, and I'm like, oh, let me tell you about my day. Which, you know, I, yeah. And again, and, and I'm so grateful for the space you make for me, and I hope, like, I, I quit cigars, what, ses, almost Six seven months, months ago. ago. That was like a, a last vestige. <laughs> he has I had, nothing I had, now. He has no vices. I don't nothing. Nothing. Got nothing. Anyway. But my point is, is I, I know I, I, I knew I do need to keep moving towards Elena, and the effect is one of richness that I, 
on the other side of it when I take contrary action to that old pattern of retreating. And because we've communicated that to each other, I think that's the, the takeaway the, in right, my non-psychology yeah. theo- or uh, uh, marriage family therapy mm-hmm. background, which I don't have other than just hearing some of the beautiful things he said, is if you don't communicate in a way that says, this is what I need, that's what you need. I don't know who to quote, but I, I heard a therapist say that um, relationships, marriage is not 50-50 because you can't do that to the other person. If Steve walks in the door, being drained from hearing people talk about all their stuff. And he walks in and he says, I'm at a five. I can give you 5% right now. Cool. I've had a kind of restful day. I got the laundry done, the dishes are done, the kids are doing their homework. What day I can is that give though? 95. What day is that? But you know what I mean? 95%? Sure. But then I, he could walk in the door and say, you know what? I had an easy client and I slept really good last night. I'm like at a 75 today. And I could be like, good, because I need you to fill in all the blanks because I'm done. I just can't. Mm-hmm. I didn't talk to anyone today <laughs> or whatever. And I need to refill. So. Exactly. Right. That communication. Which, yeah. yeah. I think. Well, and that's what the awareness. We can, we can arrest those generational patterns. Mm-hmm. And, that our parents and- didn't never talk about. My mom kind of was taught to be very submissive to the things that my dad needed mm-hmm. or whatever and well and, and, and oh I beg your pardon no, no go for it and so often people live more in reaction to their core wounds than in relationship Relation. with each other and the effect of relationships is that they can either exacerbate pain or heal pain um, we're drawn to what is family, familiar, not because it ne- it's necessarily good for us, but because on some level it feels right. I, I know this dance. Even the negative right. things it's, in Right, especially the negative. We're drawn to re- recreate that core pattern, that core wound, in hopes of arriving at a different outcome, only so often to be re-injured. And that's where, you know, that I, I stay busy in my practice, you know. So there are uh, several other patterns. There's the avoider. And I'm, I, I hope and I aspire to keep uh, moving more towards Elena. And, I, um, and, and then, then there's the pleaser, right? Which many, in many ways is, is a form of dishonesty, right? It's kind of sublimating one's own wants, needs in favor of someone else. But the effect over time is that resentment builds. Mm-hmm. So um, then there are then there's what's called we call the vacillator from this book. A vacillator is someone who, who mistakes intensity for intimacy, and the uh, characterized very often by uh, volatile home families of origin, home life, addiction, um, a lot of conflict, abuse, um, and then there are the more kind of pervasive um, conditions uh, styles. Uh, victim and controller, and they can they can alternate. They can they're two sides of the same coin very often, and that, and that's a bit more uh, a challenging uh, when it comes to being a therapist. Um, but for purposes of illustration, kind of Elena and I have endeavored to give you kind of a, a window into the dance we do, um, and with the idea that secure attachment is the ideal that we all strive for without really articulating it as such. And the qualities of secure attachment, um, as I mentioned before, among them really um, safety and and the the feeling of of emotional safety, Mm -hmm. that I can be in my mess. And I know this. This is why um, a a big part of uh, why um, I'm just grateful to be here and, and with Elena is because I know with the storms of life that bring me to my knees, I, I don't even doubt. I just, I just, it's unfailing that Elaine is there. And there's not judgment. There's she, she'll get down in the hole with me and 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 walk beside me, and we climb out together. And she brings me back to Christ. Well, and then he's also taught me the the way to speak to each other in a way that um, doesn't have me pleasing all the time it has me giving you know of myself in a way uh, to be present for him but then to ask for what i need which is hard for me um which is a great uh transition to our communication tools so i'll pass while you oh thank you very much i want to pass those back there I think that, that covers it. Did you get one? No. Oh, more. oh, here we go. We... And then Carla. Um, 
Let me get you one. There you go. Uh, Brenda, you, oh, very good. All right. So, what I'd like to do is alternate reading aloud, a little audience participation. Um, the five essential elements of healthy communication. Uh, who would like to read number one aloud for us? I love it. Can you tell us your name? I'm no, sorry, Bianca. 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 Love it. Thank you, Bianca. Uh, so number one, personal yeah. responsibility. Yes. Take ownership of your feelings. Am I reacting from having a memory button activated or triggered? If it's hysterical, it's historical. Feelings are not always facts. Can be important indicators of me. Beautiful. Thank you, Bianca. So, I'm over here, right? Oh. And, and you're over there, and you're like, what's the big deal? Just, just pick up the bottle of water, right? You don't know the history. You don't know that my pet rat Randy drowned in a bottle of spilled purified drinking water from Kroger. You don't know that. You don't know my memory button, right? All the images flashing before me of Randy, the little rat, and, and the chest compressions and the CPR. You don't know that, right? But when you do know that, you have a better understanding, right, of my feelings in that moment. And that's part of, a big part of healthy communication is my own connection to feeling. And it's often there's a, a separation between head and heart. If there's been trauma, uh, addiction, right? It's really adaptive to a large degree when we can, in moments of fight or flight, when the amygdala, right, the alarm is activated. We don't want to connect with feeling. Lives are on the line, survival. But then there's a point at which in the context of intimacy and connection, that divorce from he between head and heart is a liability. And that's where being in connection uh, offers that opportunity. And really in order to, to cultivate secure attachment, my personal responsibility need be in the form of connecting with this because feelings not always facts, but can be important indicators of need, right? So I'm hungry, what's the need? I need to eat, eat right? I'm fearful Bob hates me. Bob walked in the office, didn't even look at me. He always says hi, but he didn't look at me today. Well, he must hate, right? No, come to learn, Bob's pet rat, Randy, drowned. <laughs> He's not even thinking about me. In that case, the feeling is not the fact. You follow, right? So part of personal responsibility is, f is cultivating that connection between head and heart, right? Uh, I'll take number two. So uh, uh, number two, presentation. With the wrong presentation, I cannot give an ice cold bottle of Kroger purified drinking water to a man dying of thirst in the desert. If my presentation is wrong, he'll be like, no, I'm good, I'd rather, rather die, right? With the right presentation, I can sell at top dollar a bottle of Kroger purified drinking water to a fish. The fish is like, yes, I need that, right? So, point being, presentation. There's a, there's a difficult uh, conflict situation in a, in a relationship, right? So, if you want to fight, I'm being a little coy here. If you want to fight, you should start with the word you. The first word out of your mouth should be the word you. If I want resolution, I best start with the word I, and in particular, I feel statements are the cornerstone of healthy communication and maximize the likelihood that I will have my wants and needs heard, honored, and met, right? So, uh, there's a difficult circumstance, okay? And I'm gonna get Stephen's page and I'm gonna look at the feelings. On the back, right, there's a whole list of feeling words and appropriate attribution. It's from this book, this remarkable book, How We Love. Um, the correct structure is as follows. I feel, and then the feeling word, when you, and then the difficult behavior or concern after the feeling, right? So, incorrect structure. People often think they're doing it correctly. I feel that. I feel like. No, no, no. Like or that, not a feeling, right? I feel like. I feel that. You're always, it's a thinly veiled you missile, right? <laughs> So, 
you messages immediately put the listener in a, def in a defensive stance, ready to retaliate. If it's payback, then start with you. Launch that, get that flamethrower out, launch that you missile. You'll get that dopamine hit. It's gonna feel good for about half a second and then it's gonna be much worse, right? But if I'm more invested in, in connection, in a repair, okay, well, uh, then it's, because th then there's no excuse anymore, right? You're, it's, resp you're, it's, it's laziness if, it, if, if, if you're just kind of like, ah, I'm gonna wing it, right? Yeah, I feel that, no, 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 okay. So point being, right, you're gonna get the form, you're gonna review it in times that are good so that when the temperature rises, as it does, as it will, right? You have it, you're ready, it's at your fingertips. So, um, an additional component of effective presentation is the compliment cookie. So, the, if you imagine Oreo. an Oreo cookie, yes. Top cookie, genuine positive affirmation of the listener. The ooey gooey Oreo cookie center is the difficult message in the form of an I feel statement and then the bottom chocolate cookie of the Oreo cookie, right? Also a genuine positive affirmation of the listener. So consider, if you will, Jack and Jill. Jack's wearing a very colorful shirt, right? Jill says to Jack, honey, I, I, I really like that shirt. I'm concerned it might be a little casual for the party. Would you consider your blue button down? You, you look great in that one, right? Consider the corollary. You're wearing that? Oh, you're gonna wear that? Well, he is now. He definitely is now, right? So, um, uh, another helpful way, I, I could use your help. I need your help. Like when we talk to the girls, like, mm -hmm. hey, sweetie, I need your help. Okay, would you pick up your toys, sweetie? You're so helpful, right? Not, you are so messy. You right, never yeah, put your right. toys away. Pick that up, pick your, right? Relationship, Without uh, rules, without relationship invites rebellion. Rules without relationship invites rebellion. When you have that relationship, when there's the experience of acceptance and connection, th the other stuff follows. I think that was Dennis Prager. R relationship rules without relationship invite rebellion. Um, so that's presentation. I can th th affect two totally different outcomes. If I'm, if I'm really just casual and kind of careless and I don't take personal responsibility in how I present something, my feelings around a concern, the, the outcome could be hijacked versus if I'm intentional about the way I present a concern, the, the possibility of, of a favorable outcome where the two of us are closer together, where there's understanding and closure is much greater. So it, that's, that's where presentation is key. Um, who, who would be so kind as to read uh, Straight Talk? Charlie, kind sir. Say what you mean and mean what you say. That, that's right, exactly, I love it. Don't so, say, but don't say it mean. Say, but don't say it mean, I, I should add that. <laughs> um, so, Nuances of presentation, right? These are not to the exclusion of honesty, of, of being authentic. We're still saying what we mean and meaning what we say, but we're packaging it in a way that's palatable for the listener. Does that make sense? Um, nurturing. Brenda. Come from, come from empathy. Where there is empathy, there is intimacy. There can be intimacy. Brilliant, that's exactly right. Leading with empathy. And that's where um, the work around attachment and learning about each other's histories, core wounds, in, in the context of, of connection, of relationships, a sensitivity uh, around each other's memory buttons, right? I'm not, I'm not encouraging like overindulgence or, or um, kind of a, um, a secondary gain kind of a pampering or, or not that, but, but empathy, right? Does that make sense? So when I, when I can lead with empathy for Elena and Elena me, there can be understanding, there can be intimacy. Um, and then number five, who would be so kind? Uh, Bianca, I love it. 
fighting fair, no name calling for shops below the belt. Brilliant. Love it. Yes. So, thank you very much. Um, my suggestions to my clients are really make this part of your bones. When, when the temperature's comfortable, review, review. Repet Betty used to say, repetition is the mother of knowledge. Repetition is the mother of knowledge. I always say that twice. But that, that uh, I think um, Betty is, I, I'm hoping she's smiling down from heaven right now, because wow. Um, but um, so the, these are communication tools. And I always, always generally um, couple this with some education, some, some um, suggestions around de-escalation. When the temperature rises, each other's, you know, uh, activating or, or, or poking the other and pushing each other's memory buttons, right? as a way to exact revenge or payback in a way that it's going downhill fast, right? So that's where uh, I try to educate my clients on the timeout strategy. Okay, you know, I'm really, I'm feeling activated, I'm triggered, I need to step away. And, and there really need be a good faith commitment from each other that either one can invoke a timeout at any given time and it need be honored. It's not one parting shot as you walk out the, no, no. It need be honored. And then part two of the timeout is as important or, you know, or arguably more important than part one. And that's, let's revisit this in an hour in the kitchen or, you know, after the baby's asleep, right? That key because the effect of not, uh, of forfeiting part two is that it's swept under the rug only to be tripped over in an hour, a week, a year. And alternately, the partner feels abandoned often. Make sense? Yeah. So, and then, and then as my clients are kind of uh, internalizing the tools, a lot of times I'll suggest, you know, write them down between now and next session and bring them in until you are more adept at using the tools, right? And then I also offer a bit of, and I'll kind of start to close with this, um, for today, our talk, uh, a little bit of a bit of instruction around anger and its effect, and um, the spectrum of behaviors from passive to aggressive. Um, a lot of times, there there's really very little understanding around the sweet spot of healthy human behavior, which is assertiveness. Assertiveness is a bit past midpoint, cl a little closer to aggressive, but still far away from aggressive, but a, a little bit farther from passive, right? Assertiveness is saying what you mean, meaning what you say. You have a connection head to heart, are able to identify the feeling and then articulate the need from that feeling, right? But so, so often what happens, the memory buttons get triggered, the amygdala lights up, the fight or flight or freeze response is activated and the flamethrowers come out. And, and really what keeps you know, me busy with clients uh, is, is the fallout. It's, it's, it's the aftermath, you know. Uh, each other, they've triggered each other again and again. The wounds have compounded to, to such an extent that unfortunately a lot of times it, it's, it's uh, you know, on, on life support when they get into my office. So. Um, maintaining kind of an ongoing inventory. I'll encourage clients kind of have a daily check-in, right? What, what, what um, Mylan and Kay would refer to as a comfort circle. A designated listener, a designated speaker, 15 minutes even. How are you feeling? You know, asking clarifying questions and then switch. Um, but where there's anger, the underlying message is lost, right? Um, I encourage my clients, don't get mad, get sad. What's underneath the anger? Anger is a secondary emotion to underlying hurt, pain, fear. And particularly we men are, are socialized. We bypass sad, go right to mad because there's that feeling of power. And there's a place for anger, right? But in the context of connection, anger so often proves so, so damaging that, that that to try to recover from that, you know, it uh, keeps me busy. But and that's where, again, you know, being able to access the sad under the mat, a willingness to be vulnerable, the effect is that it, can, it, it, it draws a part, your partner closer where there, where there is that sadness versus the anger which throws the walls higher and wider. And the effect is altogether um, 
very devastating. And, and that's fortunately something, and I, I just kind of as we close, I'm again grateful to Elena um, for the inspiration you've offered me and in terms of deepening my faith walk and, and um, routinely bringing me back to Jesus. Mm -hmm. um, thankful to Betty and um, thankful for all of you.